Welcome to the Unfolding Restoration. My name is Anthony Sweat. Uh, in this video series, we look at how the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ unfolded line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here and a little there, particularly the foundations of the restoration, the main things that the modern church is built on today. Uh, in this uh, lesson number 20, the title of this one is The Presentation of the Temple Endowment. And I'm so excited to share this lesson with you. I want to say up front, I know this is a public video. Uh, the, the things that I share in this video will be in harmony with the spirit of the temple. Uh, in uh, quotes and different sources that I will use will be from published sources of the church uh, that are publicly available. And uh, keeping sacred things sacred, of course. But at the same time, I think it's necessary that we talk about the temple openly. That we talk about it clearly. As a matter of fact, I think we might have done a disservice in some previous generations in that we haven't prepared people well enough for the temple endowment to understand it, to understand why it happens and what is happening. As a matter of fact, I've done this experiment before with students of mine where I'll say, in one sentence, uh, give me uh, why we get baptized. Um, and you know, they'll give me a great one sentence summary. Or in one sentence, tell me why we take the sacrament. In one sentence, tell me why we ordain people to priesthood offices. Uh, in one sentence, even give me why we seal a family or a couple together in the temple. And they can usually do it, and they do it well. But if I say to my students, uh, most of them return missionaries, in one sentence, tell me about the endowment, they can't do it. Uh, and not only can they not do it, not only do they not understand it, they don't even know what they can and can't say as a whole. Um, that's a problem that I think we need to correct. We need to do better teaching the doctrinal purposes, the doctrinal reasons behind the temple and the temple endowment in particular. In this video, I'm going to focus more on the presentation of the endowment, not the temple endowment itself. If you want to understand more about the endowment itself, I'd encourage you to go back and watch lesson number 14 in this series. But maybe that's a lesson right up front that I hope you grasp. I like to say to my students, there's a difference between endowment and the presentation of the endowment. Endowment is a power. The presentation of the endowment is a pedagogy or a method or an instruction. Uh, one, one is a ceremony, the endowment. The other one is a priesthood power uh, that comes into our life. Lesson 14 will teach you about the power of endowment. This lesson will get into the presentation of the endowment as a whole. Well, a little personal history as we start. On May 3rd, 1842, my third great-grandfather, his name is Shadrach Roundy, um, got to do something cool. He and a few other men like Dimmick Huntington and Noah Rogers and Daniel Cams and Lucius Scoville, they were asked by Joseph Smith to come help him do something in his Nauvoo red brick store. They showed up there on May 3rd, 1842, and my third great-grandfather and these other men helped Joseph Smith rearrange the upper room of the main room of the red brick store and Joseph's office. They painted a mural on the wall. They brought in some plants and uh, cedar boughs and, um, and, and olive branches and other things to suggest a garden-type setting. They divided up the room, the main big room, using rugs and canvases. And they even carried water. One of the men remembers carrying a bunch of water up uh, and uh, using it, uh, placing it in Joseph Smith's uh, little office space. In other words, what they did to the Nauvoo Red Brick store was they rearranged it as much as circumstances would permit, as they later recalled, to represent a temple interior with Joseph Smith in the words of Lucius Scoville, quote, dictating everything. The first presentation of the endowment in this dispensation that we know of anyway was given in that upper floor of the red brick store uh, in Nauvoo, Illinois, the very next day on May 4th, 1842. And this is Joseph's journal entry for May 4th, 1842. Joseph said, I spent the day in the upper part of the store in council with General James Adams of Springfield, Patriarch Hiram Smith, Bishops Newell K. Whitney and George Miller, and President Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball and Willard Richards, instructing them in the principles and order of the priesthood, attending to washings, anointings, endowments, and the communication of keys, 
pertaining to the Aaronic priesthood, and so on to the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, setting forth the order pertaining to the Ancient of Days, and all those plans and principles by which anyone is enabled to secure the fullness of those blessings which have been prepared for the Church of the Firstborn, and come up and abide in the presence of Elohim in the eternal worlds. That's how Joseph Smith summarized the presentation of the endowment that he gave there in Nauvoo in 1842. And the reason why Joseph did it in the red brick store was because uh, the Nauvoo temple was yet under construction, was not finished yet, and Joseph started to sense, have an impending sense, that his life was going to come to an end before the Nauvoo temple was finished. So he presented the ceremony of the endowment in the red brick store. He also presented the ceremony of the endowment in a few other places in Nauvoo. It was done in his, what's called his old homestead, his home that was built across the street. It was also done in the mansion house, the larger home that was finished that he moved into in Nauvoo. And there's records that uh, the endowment was done also in Brigham Young's home there in Nauvoo. And why? Well, why, why were they doing this presentation of the endowment? Well, again, back to video 14, Joseph had been learning about the concept, the power of endowment all along, ever since, I believe, uh, as early as 1830, 31, Joseph is teaching about uh, endowment and how to help people get the power of God in their life. But in Nauvoo, he's going to package everything by divine revelation and through prophetic authority into a ceremony or a presentation. The Lord told them to build a temple to do this. In Doctrine and Covenants, uh, section 124, verse 28, now, they built a temple in Kirtland, of course, but the temple in Kirtland did not have um, the different rooms and set up and spaces like we see in a modern temple today. This temple that the Lord told, tells them to build in Nauvoo would be a little bit different. He says in verse 41 that he's going to reveal things that have been kept hid or uh, things to reveal in verse 28, the fullness of the priesthood uh, is what he calls, uh, and to build a temple to do so. The Lord told Joseph Smith in verse 42 that, the, that he would show Joseph everything, quote, pertaining to this house and the priesthood thereof, or the priesthood ordinances thereof. Joseph would say in 1843 in a discourse with this idea of fullness of the priesthood, quote, if a man gets the fullness of God, he has got to get it in the same way that Jesus Christ obtained it, and that was by keeping all the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Uh, connecting to this greater endowment or this fullness of the priesthood that would be revealed in Nauvoo through the temple endowment. As a matter of fact, this fullness of the priesthood, Joseph will sometimes call it the order, uh, the holy order, or the order of the Son of God. We, we read about the order of the Son of God all the time in the scriptures, and sometimes we don't know what to mean or to make of it, the order of Melchizedek. I want you to think of order almost like a select group of people, which is one of the definitions of order. All of you who are Harry Potter fans out there, you know about Harry, uh, you know, Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix, the select group of people who fought against Voldemort. And I don't want to be too light in something as sacred as the temple uh, and with the Order of Melchizedek, but what Joseph was doing was he was helping people to enter into the Order of the Son of God. In that earlier quote that I read to you, the Order of the Ancient of Days um, uh, or the Order of the Priesthood is what Joseph would call it. Joseph would endow approximately 90 men and women into this order through the temple endowment ceremonies in his lifetime. This group was known as the Quorum of the Anointed, or sometimes simply as the Holy Order of God. And this was Joseph's way through these ceremonies to create an order of priests and priestesses. It was his way to help fulfill what Joseph had learned by revelation that God intended to make people in his kingdom to become priests and kings and queens and priestesses who have received of his fullness after the order of Melchizedek. That's Doctrine and Covenants 76, 56, 57, talking about those who are exalted in heaven. Those who are after this order, according to section 107, verse 19, have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens open unto them, to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, 
So I'm sharing these maybe a little bit more obscure or a little bit more esoteric verses to show that in Nauvoo, the Lord through his prophet is going to introduce these ceremonies to help people enter into a sacred order of priests, future priests and priestesses, people who can receive the fullness of God's power or priesthood as we call it, a fullness of his blessings, a fullness to become like him a fullness of exaltation of women and men together through these covenants and ordinances and teachings to be able to know how to commune with God, how to uh, have angels minister to them, and, and how to have uh, understand the mysteries and teachings of the kingdom of God. That's what section 107 and 76 seems to be getting at uh, with the temple endowment presentation. Now, one of the things up front that we have to talk about in this video is what is the relationship between the presentation of the temple endowment and this thing called Freemasonry? Many of you uh, have likely heard of this connection before, maybe in roundabout ways, you've never investigated it fully. There's some great resources out there, and I'll do my best in this video to summarize and give you some perspectives on the relationship. Uh, there is no question that there is a relationship between the two, between the presentation of the endowment and some of the ceremonies found in Freemasonry. But I want to emphasize again, this is why I like saying this line, it's so crucial. There is a difference between endowment and the presentation of the endowment. Endowment is a power, the presentation is a pedagogy or a method. History is very clear. Sometimes people just want, they want to say, Joseph Smith ripped off the endowment from Masonry is what they say. I completely and personally totally disagree with that assessment. Not only do I think it conflates endowment and the presentation of the endowment, but it's also not true historically. Joseph Smith has learned many concepts long before his exposure to Freemasonry. Uh, Joseph learned of the idea of detecting true messengers of God from false ones as early as when he was in Harmony, Pennsylvania, between 1829 and 1831. Joseph learned about the idea of becoming great high priests to God as early as June of 1831. He was the June 1831 conference. Joseph learned that people could part the veil and come into God's presence, that, as he taught there. He learned about people becoming priests and kings to God as early as 1832, as I read that quote in section 76. He began to do ceremonial washings and anointings as early as January 1833 with the School of the Prophets and in the Kirtland Temple. Joseph uh, learned things that, like to achieve the power of endowment, you need to be chaste, you need to be obedient, you need to live the law of consecration, you need to get rid of inappropriate laughter and light-mindedness. He learned all those principles that are outlined in section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants as early as 1833. He learned ideas about the creation, the fall, the atonement uh, in the Kirtland period as he translated the Book of Moses and the book of Abraham. He learned about key words, signs, or sacred things that are only to be had in the temple in that period. What I'm trying to say is that Joseph learned most of these major concepts back to an unfolding restoration, line upon line and precept upon precept, long before he ever had his own personal exposure to Freemasonry and long before he became a Mason himself. Well, what is Joseph Smith's connection to Masonry, uh, by the way? Uh, Joseph was not a Mason. As a matter of fact, the earliest known source of Joseph uh, saying anything about Masonry is clear back in 1830 to the Colesville branch. He simply says, beware the Freemasons. There was a, a feeling of mistrust of Masonry earlier on, but there were early church members uh, who were Masons, and it was not uncommon for people to be a Freemason uh, during this time period. Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball were longtime Masons, and in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith's brother Hiram was a Mason, as was Joseph's counselor uh, at the time and political advisor, a man named John C. Bennett. They had helped organize a Masonic lodge in Nauvoo, and Joseph, ever the learner, ever someone interested in, in grasping and understanding things, started to become interested in it as well. So in March of 1842, Joseph Smith was taught about Masonry, and he became uh, an entered apprentice and ultimately a master Mason himself in March of 1842 as a lodge was set up there uh, in Nauvoo, Illinois. Now, it's not coincidental, notice those dates, that was in March of 1842. J 
Joseph gives the first presentation of the endowment ceremony in May of 1842, six weeks later. That I don't think is coincidental. I also don't think it's coincidental from the earlier quote that I read you about George Miller, Heber C. Kimball, Brigham Young, Hiram Smith, um, the, all those nine men who on May 4th, 1842, participated in the first presentation of the endowment in the red brick store, all nine of those men were Masons as well. Uh, why? Well, likely because Joseph chose those men because they would understand the ceremony. They would understand the connections. They would make sense of it as a whole. So what I'm trying to say is there is a connection. So really quickly, this isn't a video on the history of Freemasonry uh, as a whole, um, but I want to give you a quick brief background. I'm going to read a little bit to you from my friend and colleague and scholar Steve Harper uh, in his article, Freemasonry and the LDS Temple Endowment, in a book called A Reason for Faith. He says this, summarizes, members of a Masonic lodge hold elaborate meetings in which they retell stories of the ancient origins of Masons who were among those Solomon commissioned to build a temple in Jerusalem. These stories both entertain and teach members to be loyal and worthy of each other's trust as well as God's. In their meetings, Masons acted out and enlarged the brief biblical account of Hiram of Tyre, a widow son of the tribe of Naphtali. In the Masonic story, Solomon charges Hiram to build the temple. Hiram refuses to reveal the word of the master Mason to some of his subordinates and is murdered for his fidelity. Emulating Hiram, Masons ritually advanced by degrees from entered apprentice to fellow craft to master Mason, using gestures, secret words, and ritual clothing. As a person advanced in the order, he metaphorically went deeper into Solomon's temple on a quest for more light. And this image right here of the compass and the square with a G in the middle is the symbol of Masonry as a whole. And they use the compass and the square to symbolize different things. Masonry is trying to take, it's a, it's a, a fraternity of men, one of the things they're trying to do is teach men how to be good, moral, uh, righteous men uh, as a whole and to live righteous principles and to care for each other and to care for their widows uh, and family members who may be uh, left behind. Um, it's meant, in, in essence, it's meant to support each other. It's unsure, and, and Freemasonry scholars, and from what I'm, I've read about it, it's unclear when Masonry itself develops. It probably started in Europe around 1300 AD as kind of a trade guild where masons, like literally these are brick and stone masons, uh, could support each other in their masonry work. They could teach each other about the craft, about the tools of the trade, etc. Um, and they also start to share other knowledge with each other uh, and support each other. And it develops into this uh, fraternity to help uh, men this way. Over the years, and by 1700, it's a common esoteric fraternity. You've all heard that George Washington uh, was a Mason. You've heard that Benjamin Franklin was a Mason. Uh, I like to joke around that Nicolas Cage uh, was a Mason. Um, but other people were, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Harry Truman, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's beautiful Masonic temples uh, all throughout uh, the world uh, and the United States as a whole. Well, why is there some, some overlap uh, between the two then, between the presentation of the endowment, even in that brief review those who have been uh, and participated in the temple, you can see connections. Why is there overlap uh, between some of the areas? Well, there's two general theories. One that I like to call the apostasy theory, the other I like to call the adoption theory. The apostasy theory is that masonry did tap into ancient orders and ways of doing things and knowledge, but that it was a secular or maybe, uh, and I don't mean this pejoratively, an apostatized version of ancient rituals and symbols and ceremonies, and that what Joseph was doing was Joseph was restoring it to its original higher purposes. Instead of talking about Hiram of Tyre, let's learn about the plan of salvation and use the story of Adam and Eve. Instead of using the clothing to symbolize these different orders, let's connect it to priesthood uh, and covenants. Instead of teaching people about faith, hope, charity, let's teach people about obedience and sacrifice and consecration. Uh, uh, et cetera. Instead of going deeper into Solomon's temple, we progress until we come into the presence of God in the celestial kingdom. The apostasy theory, here's Heber C. Kimball, uh, here's some quotes on it. We have received some precious things through the prophet on the priesthood, which would cause your soul to rejoice. This is a letter that he writes to Parley P. Pratt. I cannot give them to you on paper, for they are not to be written, so you must come and get them for yourself. There is a similarity of priesthood in masonry. Brother Joseph says masonry was taken from priesthood, 
but has become degenerated, but many things are perfect. That's uh, Heber C. Kimball, and you can see the apostasy theory there. Willard Richards writes, Masonry had its origin in the priesthood. A hint, the wise is sufficient. So there's, there's that, maybe Joseph is restoring it. That's the apostasy theory. The adoption theory is that Joseph Smith learned all of these concepts over a decade of his prophetic ministry, and that when he became a Mason and participated in their ceremonies, he in essence went, that's really effective. I like how they're doing that, but I'm going to adopt it and adapt it to my purposes to teach these concepts that God has taught me, and that's the adoption theory. Here's Stephen Harper on the adoption theory. Joseph started with what he had and used what the saints found familiar to lead them to further light and knowledge. Perhaps Joseph thought of Masonic ideas and practices as a way to impart knowledge that was suited to the simplest of saints and rich enough to reward a lifetime's journey toward God. Or historian Richard Bushman from Rust Stone Rolling put it this way, Joseph often requested revelation about things that caught his attention. He had a green thumb for growing ideas from tiny seeds. That's a wonderful line. Masonic rites seem to have been one more provocation. Intrigued by the Masonic rites, Joseph turned the material to his own use. The Masonic elements that appeared in the Temple Endowment were embedded in a distinctive context, the creation instead of the Temple of Solomon, exaltation rather than fraternity, God and Christ, not the worshipful master. Temple covenants bound people to God rather than to each other. At the end, the participants entered symbolically into the presence of God. Endowment, Joseph's name for the temple ceremony, connected it to promises made long before his encounter with Freemasonry. That's from Rough Stone Rolling. Here's, by the way, the church's own summary of it, using both of those. Uh, there are different ways to understand the relationship between Masonry and the temple. Some Latter-day Saints point to similarities between the format and symbols of both the endowment and Masonic rituals, and those of many ancient religious ceremonies as evidence that the endowment was a restoration of an ancient ordinance. Others know that the ideas and institutions in the culture that surrounded Joseph Smith frequently contributed to the process by which he obtained revelation. In any event, the endowment did not simply imitate the rituals of Freemasonry. Rather, Joseph's encounter with Masonry evidently served as a catalyst for revelation. And that's maybe one point as I move off Masonry here and its overlap. Whether it's the adoption theory or the apostasy theory, to me is irrelevant. Uh, for me personally, uh, as section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants teaches, that when those in prophetic authority do things truly and faithfully in the name of the Lord and by virtue of their prophetic keys and the sealing power, it becomes law recognized by God on earth and in heaven. So whatever the origin of the overlap, Either way, Joseph, as the authorized prophet of God, initiated these ceremonies that have become the binding law or the binding ordinances and covenants, the binding priesthood ritual by which you and I enter into uh, this sacred order of priests to one day receive the fullness of the priesthood from God uh, to become exalted. That, to me, is what is important. These are the ordinances through a prophet using his keys recognized by God as a whole. I'll talk a little bit more about adapting the ceremony uh, in a minute. With Along that line, by the way, the original endowment uh, did not last an hour and a half or two hours. The original endowment lasted, quote, the better part of a day. Uh, that's from the Temple Endowment on Church History Topics. Even after Joseph administered the presentation of the endowment to this first group of people, he told Brigham Young that the ceremony was not perfect and needed some modifications. He said this, quote, this is not arranged right, but we have done the best we could under the circumstances. I wish you to take this matter in hand and organize and systematize all these ceremonies, end of quote. Brigham would later recall uh, from this uh, later recollection, the secondhand source, that every time Brigham participated in or performed the ceremonies in Nauvoo, he said he, quote, got something more. After Joseph Smith's death, it was Brigham and the Twelve who had received all these ordinances that continued to build the temple and then ultimately give these ordinances to roughly 5,000 Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo, Illinois. A major, major work and an empowering work for the church as they prepared uh, to go west. 
He and the Twelve continue to modify and to adapt, to add things to the ceremony, uh, to clarify things in the ceremony, so that the time that they gave them in the Nauvoo Temple to these 5,000 Latter-day Saints, roughly, Brigham recollected, quote, we had our ceremonies pretty correct uh, as a whole. But I want you to see that from the beginning, the ceremony was being adapted, and that the ceremony was not seen as being set in stone. That's an important idea historically to see. Even in Nauvoo and in the early church, uh, they weren't doing it from any sort of a written or prescribed. It was all oral or transmitted by memory, so of course there was variation. It wasn't until 1877, with the completion of the St. George Temple in southern Utah, that they started to say, let's systematize. Remember, the church, when they get to Utah, uh, they finish the St. George Temple, they're building the Salt Lake Temple, they've got the Logan Temple and the Manti Temple, and Brigham, uh, before he dies, says, let's get this systematized, let's get it all written down. He asked Wilford Woodruff to write down the endowment and the temple ordinances, which Wilford Woodruff said he, quote, wrote all the ordinances and presented them to the satisfaction of President Brigham Young as a whole, and Brigham approved them. Saints Volume 2 puts it this way, as Wilford worked in the temple, Brigham asked him and other church leaders to write out the endowment ceremony and other temple ordinances. Since the time of Joseph Smith, the words of the ordinances had been preserved only through word of mouth. Now that the ordinances would be performed at a distance from church headquarters, Brigham wanted the ceremonies written down to ensure they would occur the same way in each temple. So one main idea I want you to grasp as we talk about the presentation of the endowment versus endowment is this idea is that there's a difference between the two. Remember, a presentation is a teaching tool. Sometimes we say the endowment is a gift. And by that, I think we mean the power of endowment, the power to have uh, the power of God, to receive a fullness of his blessings, to discern truth from error, to understand his purposes, his mysteries, to commune with angels, to receive revelation. Those are all powers. That's the gift, to be bound to him by covenant, to be cleansed and purified and become one of his great uh, priests or priestesses, kings and queens. Those are all gifts. But... The way those gifts are packaged, like we all understand at Christmas, I can make a gift for my children and package it in a lot of ways or present it to them in various ways to get the gift. Um, the words, the actions, the clothing, the setting, the symbols, and other teaching methods can be adapted uh, and altered by those who are in prophetic authority and by revelation. We shouldn't presume to think that what we do, the ceremony that we perform in the temple, is exactly what Adam and Eve or Abraham and Sarah or Joseph and Emma did. Uh, it's not. It can't be. Logically, by the way, it's not even the exact same as the ceremony was a year ago at the time of uh, filming this video, let alone 10 years ago or 100 years ago, let alone centuries or millennia ago. Remember, the endowment is a gift, but the presentation of the endowment is how that gift is given. And that can be altered by those who are in prophetic authority. The First Presidency wrote when the most recent changes in the presentation of the endowment came about, through inspiration, the methods of instruction in the temple experience have changed many times, even in recent history, to help members better understand and live what they learn in the temple. For me personally, I think what is ancient in the temple is that there are ancient elements in that ceremony. There are ancient ideas in this order of, of becoming part of priests or priestesses to God uh, that Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph and Emma entered into. That's the things that's ancient or ancient knowledge, ancient truth as a whole. That's why Joseph says this is I'm establishing the order of the ancient of days. Endowment is the capacity to come into the presence of God and receive a fullness of his blessings. And the presentation is how those covenants and concepts are communicated. I might be even so bold as to say this, that you and I can participate in the endowment ceremony and not be endowed, in the same, endowed with power, in the same way that we can participate in a baptism and a conferral of the Holy Ghost and not yet receive the Holy Ghost. Endowment is something, a power, that we have to live up to and attain unto through righteous covenant living with God. Presentation of the endowment is teaching us these concepts of how to accomplish that in our life. 
receive a fullness of his blessings. Well, when we participate in the endowment ceremony, we therefore experience and reenact a symbolic upward journey that takes a fallen person into the redeemed presence of God. It's a beautiful idea taught by, taught about the plan of redemption and empowered through covenants uh, and through ordinances and knowledge to ultimately become an heir of eternal life. Following ancient patterns, as I mentioned, the endowment is a religious drama. Think of it almost like a play, uh, which, by the way, is ancient in this idea. There's this idea of ancient plays or ancient dramas that would teach uh, eternal truths. In this dramatization, uh, God gives us hidden sacred mysteries of his kingdom only to the intimate covenant initiated. It's that ancient idea of doing things that way. As one of my friends and, and authors, uh, Wendy Ulrich, has written, quote, the temple symbolically replicates the drama of a prophet's vision call, making it accessible to us. The temple is our dress rehearsal for a very real and personal debut, end of quote. In essence, you're entering into the modern school of the prophets, the modern school of the Adams and Eves, the Abrahams and Sarahs, the Joseph and Emmas. You're, uh, you're learning about the plan of salvation. You're receiving covenants and being empowered uh, through these ceremonies as a whole. The ceremony uh, suggests growth from glory to glory, from room to room, uh, as we increase uh, in truth and light and make covenants with God. Uh, these principles, these ideas are presented to us through symbolic characters through symbolic dialogue and clothing uh, and different uh, gestures and rituals. It's important to grasp that and understand that, that uh, a lot of the stuff that you're doing in the temple isn't literal history. Uh, it's symbolic, meant to teach eternal truths and concepts through symbolic means. Uh, the church's uh, book on uh, Endowed from on High Temple Preparation says this, quote, the characters depicted, the physical setting, the clothing worn, the signs given, and all the events covered in the temple are symbolic, end of quote. Something that I think we hear, but I'm not sure sometimes uh, we grasp uh, to the fullest extent. Speaking of symbolism, our priestly robes that we put on suggest our identity before God as covenant future high priests or priestesses to him. When I received my PhD, for example, uh, we literally went through a hooding ceremony where uh, I received my robes of a PhD with their symbolic stripes and I had a hood placed on me. Uh, I can't think of anything that's more symbolic of priesthood than literally putting on or hooding ourselves with priestly clothing that symbolize our, our status and future potential before God. Remember that in the Old Testament, the only people who were washed and anointed who put on priestly clothes and entered the holiest rooms of the temple, symbolizing God's presence, were prophets, priests, and kings. Today, all Latter-day Saints, male and female, can do this. The Lord, through his temple, literally has created a kingdom of priests, uh, as he wanted to in Moses' day, that he's done through the temple in Joseph Smith's day. Elder Robert D. Hale said that through the temple and in these ceremonies, we, quote, establish patterns of Christ-like living. These include things like obedience, making sacrifices to keep the commandments, loving one another, being chaste in thought and action, and giving of ourselves to build the kingdom of God. Through the Savior's atonement and by following these basic patterns of faithfulness, we receive power from on high to face the challenges of life. We need this divine power today more than ever. It is power we receive only through temple ordinances. And that's important, by the way. When I said that in the temple we're entering into an order of priests, we're entering into a way of living. Order is also a way of living. And when you and I participate in the holy temple today in its ceremonies, we are taught how righteous people live, the order of how they live. They're taught to us by major laws and covenants. And I am so grateful to the modern church and church leaders who are helping us to, uh, to understand that we can talk about these five major covenants openly, as Elder Hales has done here, and as Elder David A. Bednar recently did uh, in General Conference as well. On the church's own temple website, they say that in the ceremony, 
quote, in conjunction with these ordinances, you will be invited to make specific covenants with God. These covenants include the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity, and the law of consecration, end of quote. That's from the church's own uh, temple website. In the current general handbook of instructions in section 29, they also list these five major covenants of the temple, giving a definition of what each of them mean. It is appropriate and we should prepare people uh, that before they participate in the presentation of the endowment, what these major covenants are, what they mean, and what they're going to bind themselves by covenant to do and to follow with God as a whole. I would highly encourage as I wrap up this video that you do look at the church's uh, website. If you go to temples.churchofjesuschrist.org, there's a whole section there. You can go to one that's called About the Endowment. There's a wonderful section on prophetic teachings on the temple. Great resources that are available, great videos to help people see what the church and church leadership are trying to teach um, about that as a whole. As I conclude, I want to give a parable uh, to you that I've given to my students and that I've written about in the past that I like to call the parable of approaching the king. Uh, I'm going to give this to you and I'm going to let you interpret it and see as a whole, but the reason why I came upon this parable is because as I did some research, I'm not suggesting that this parable or that the endowment is connected into these ancient ordinances, but as I did some research one time, I learned and saw some connections of when people approached kings or royalty and different things that they had to do that had to be washed or purified, they had to be taught, uh, they had to be taught some do's and don'ts, and uh, they had to prove loyalty and faithfulness and different things like that. Uh, so with this, I give you uh, what I call uh, the parable of approaching the king. The temple of heaven is likened unto a certain woman who was invited to meet the king of her country. A seamstress by trade, this goodly commoner loyally served her king and country. To reward her faithfulness, she was called to the king's chambers by royal invitation. Having arrived on the appointed day, the common woman presented her invitation at the castle gates. Being made to pass, she was first led by the king's servant to be purified according to custom. After being cleansed, she was anointed with sweet-smelling ointments. And next, she was clothed in royal apparel, fit for an audience with the king. Last, she was instructed by the king's chief servant in all required reverences to approach her highness, the proper bows the oaths of loyalty, and never turning your back on the king. Then the woman was led to an antechamber wherein a royal servant knocked upon the large doors of the king's court. Being made to pass, the doors parted and she entered her king's presence. Demonstrating the required reverences toward his highness, the king smiled upon the woman and blessed her. Proclaiming her faithfulness, her king initiated her a member of the royal order and awarded her a gold ring set with emblematic stones, white opal for her virtue, blue sapphire for her loyalty and red ruby for her sacrifices. Whosoever hath this ring must wear it well and must always remember, said the king. And the king instructed the woman in all the ways of the kingdom from its inception and rise to its inevitable fall and providential redemption. You must return, said the king to the woman. I have more for you to understand. Come again, I will instruct you anew that you may prepare yourself to govern in my kingdom as an heir. They who have ears to hear, let them hear. I hope this video has helped you to understand the presentation of the endowment as it was revealed line upon line and precept upon precept uh, to Joseph Smith. As he was preparing in July of 1839, he said this, quote, God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve, and even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. For the day must come when no man needs to say to his neighbor, Know ye the Lord? For all shall know him, from the least to the greatest. I'm grateful for the temple that helps you and helps me through the presentation to become endowed with power from on high uh, by God, to be connected to God by further covenants, to be initiated into an ancient sacred order of future priests and priestesses so that one day you and I can learn and receive a fullness of the blessings of God in the next life. And in this life, through our covenants and through the truths we learn, have power to stay on that covenant path that's found and ultimately um, solemnized in the Holy Temple. God bless you and God bless me as we continue in this ongoing restoration through the Holy Temple.